There are over 200 million rabbits in Australia today. That's more than 10 times the number of people that live here. Now that sounds like a lot of rabbits, but it's only a fraction of the population 100 years ago when there were 10 billion rabbits across the country. And this rabbit-proof fence, the longest unbroken fence in the world, was proposed to stop rabbits getting into Western Australia from the Eastern States. The idea was a crazy attempt at control on a national scale. It seems ludicrous now to attempt to build a fence across an entire nation to keep out rabbits that can both jump very high and burrow underground. But the attempt was made and lots of money was wasted doing it. Similar unwise decisions were made to control the futures of Aboriginal children of mixed descent. Many of us are familiar with the story of the rabbit-proof fence, the epic walk that was told in a book and a movie of the same name. We generally think of it as a tragic story that illustrates the consequences of government policy that went wrong and created what Australia now refers to as the stolen generation. You may have seen the movie, but the story is much more than the movie screenplay. This is a story about the hope in the hearts of children. This true story illustrates what can be achieved when we hold on to hope and refuse to lose our dreams to intimidation. The epic journey made by three young girls in 1931 challenges us today to wonder what we could achieve if we dared to hold on to hope and had the faith to step out into the unknown. Come and walk with me along the rabbit-proof fence. It was the turn of the century. The 1900s had arrived. The end of the Victorian era and the beginning of the Edwardian era. It was an exciting time. The period featured many innovations. The first transatlantic wireless signals were sent by Marconi and the Wright brothers flew for the first time. The largest ship in the world, RMS Olympic, had sailed on its maiden voyage and her sister ship, RMS Titanic, was soon to follow. Automobiles were now common and the South Pole was reached for the first time by Raoul Amundsen. In Australia, this spirit of progress and achievement was tarnished by a massive problem. Rabbits, billions of them. They arrived in Australia with the first fleet in 1788 and became a widespread pest after 24 wild rabbits were released for hunting by an English farmer, Thomas Austin, on his property here at Barwon Park near Geelong, Victoria in 1859. The rabbits quickly spread through the newly cleared farmland and began to migrate across Australia at a rate of 120 kilometres a year reproducing at a rate of 18 to 30 per single female rabbit per year, their numbers exploded. Farmers used poison and traps in an effort to exert some control, and bounties were offered to professional rabbiters. But despite these efforts, the rabbits continued to flourish in plague proportions and were costing the nation millions of dollars in damage to crops and pastures. In 1901, a Royal Commission addressed the rabbit question, determining that in this age of scientific advancement, it must be possible to find a solution. They decided that a fence should be constructed right across the country to divide pastoral land from the dry bushlands. The first rabbit-proof fence is Australia's equivalent of the Great Wall of China traversing the vast dusty plains of Western Australia from the Southern Ocean at Starvation Boat Harbour to 80 Mile Beach, north of Port Hedland. 
more than 1,800 kilometres. It was the longest fence in the world and cut Australia into two pieces. At times, more than 400 men and 300 camels, horses and donkeys were engaged in constructing the fence. They worked against bushfires, droughts, floods and cyclones. Fire would burn the wooden posts in places. Netting beneath the ground would be eaten through or sections of the fence were buried by sand drifts. So the government employed boundary riders to maintain the fence. Boundary riders worked the fence in pairs, patrolling up and down a stretch of more than 200 kilometres and worked on repairing sections of the fence damaged by fire, flood or animals. And the boundary riders also formed relationships with Aboriginal women. Children from these relationships were called half-castes. The government, believing it was acting in the best interests of these children, unwisely decided to remove them forcibly if necessary from the Aboriginal families and culture and sent them to institutions to be raised and educated as Europeans and to eradicate their Aboriginal identity and culture. This forced removal caused great trauma and distress to the children and their families. These children became known as the Stolen Generation. By 1927, following wartime shortages and labour supplies, the fence was in disrepair. In 1930, there were calls for it to be torn down. It was then that this broken fence symbol of a society that felt its scientific and industrial progress could bring order and control to the wilderness of nature, became the scene for an amazing act of defiance and hope, and one of the longest walks in the history of the outback. Jigalong was established in 1907 as a maintenance and ration store for workmen working on the rabbit-proof fence. The store also distributed food, rations, clothing, tobacco and blankets to the Madu people who came in from the Western Desert. With a rich history and culture going back many years, the Madu were one of the last indigenous populations to come into contact with Europeans. In 1917, Molly Craig was born here at Jingalong. Molly's mother was Madhu, her father was an Englishman who was an inspector of the rabbit-proof fence. Her father named her Molly after his sister. Molly's half-sister Daisy was born in 1923. In 1931, the government forcibly removed the two girls and their cousin Gracie from their families. Molly was 14, Gracie 11 and Daisy was only eight years old. The girls were taken by car and then by train to Port Hedland further north. There they were put on the MV Kalinda, a ship bound for Fremantle. The journey by sea would take them five days. After landing in Fremantle, the girls were fascinated and bewildered by the busy city with its cars, trams and crowds of people. It was such a contrast to their desert home and surroundings. They remember stopping here at Mogamba and the matron coming inside this hotel and then bringing them sandwiches and lemonade. The next stop, Moor River Settlement. This is the site of the Moor River Settlement. Today it's in ruins, but when it was opened in 1918, one year after Molly was born, it was designed by the West Australian government to be a small, self-supporting farming settlement for about 200 Aboriginal people with a school and a health clinic. But the land wasn't good for farming. And so in the 1920s, its purpose was shifted. Residents were usually brought here against their will as the camp attempted to be an orphanage, creche, relief depot and home for old persons and unmarried mothers and the unwell without being adequately staffed or funded to provide any decent services at all. 
many Aboriginal children of mixed descent, then called half-castes, were brought here usually against their will as well. More River Settlement was under the control of Mr Neville, the West Australian protector of Aborigines. He had the power to remove any half-caste child from their family from anywhere within the state. Molly, Gracie and Daisy arrived here on the 1st of August 1931 after travelling more than a week and over 1,600 kilometres. Forced to sleep indoors and follow a strict daily schedule was foreign to the girls, who were accustomed to a life of freedom in the great open spaces of the outback. They were restless. They longed for the red sand of the desert, the starry sky at night, the warmth of the campfire and the security of their family. They longed for home. The three girls spent only two nights in the cramped conditions at Moor River before Molly decided that she was going home. And so with hope in their hearts and a deep longing for their family and land, the girls set out on an epic 1,600 kilometre journey along the rabbit proof fence. They were going home. The first night after their escape, the girls dug into an empty rabbit burrow and slept dry and warm, surrounded by, ironically, rabbits. In the morning, they woke to rabbits jumping all around them, but they had no matches, so couldn't cook any to eat. On their second day, they were given a box of matches by two Madu stockmen they met, so were able to catch and cook rabbits for their dinner. On the third day, the girls were walking in the rain, tired, cold and hungry. They'd left their coats behind so that they could walk faster. They heard chickens and stumbled into the yard of a homestead. Molly sent Gracie and Daisy up to the house to ask for food. The farmer's wife, Mrs Flanagan, invited them inside, but the girls were scared, so she assured them that she wouldn't report them. She gave them a meal of sandwiches with thick slices of mutton and tomato chutney, big slices of fruit cake and sweet milky tea. Mrs Flanagan wanted to know where the girls planned to go. Molly owned up to a plan to walk the rabbit-proof fence. It was then that Molly learned that they were walking in the wrong direction. Mrs Flanagan gave them directions to the fence. Then she packed bags with flour, sugar, salt, tea leaves, fruitcake, half a leg of mutton, bread, matches and billy tins for cooking. She also gave them warm army coats before sending the girls on their way. After the girls left with their supplies, she sent a message via the telephone exchange that she had seen the girls as she was worried that they might die walking alone in the desert. Many more farmhouses and stockmen showed kindness to the girls like Mrs Flanagan. The girls also hunted small animals and found drinking water. They survived the long walk due to the bushcraft skills taught to them by their mothers, aunties and uncles and the kindness of strangers that they met along the way. On average, the girls had to walk about 30 kilometres each day. After walking 800 kilometres from more of a settlement, they finally reached the rabbit-proof fence. Now, let's put that 800 kilometres into context. It's further than the distance between Newcastle and Brisbane on the east coast of Australia. It's about the distance that you might drive on the Hume Highway between Melbourne and the outskirts of Sydney. It's longer than the distance between New York City in America and Quebec City in Canada. And when the girls reached the rabbit-proof fence, they were only halfway along the journey. Scratches on their legs from the sharp bush became infected, so Molly and Gracie took turns in carrying Daisy, and Molly sometimes helped Gracie as well. They were cold, 
hungry and exhausted, but their longing for home and the hope in their hearts drove them on. The girls were being pursued by the police under instructions from Mr. Neville. Each day that the police spent looking for the girls was charged as a service fee to Mr. Neville's office. As the girls got further north, the costs of the chase were mounting. The local newspapers kept up a commentary on the failure to locate the girls, causing Mr. Neville great embarrassment. The girls walked on, largely oblivious to the fuss they were causing. Molly was focused on the goal of getting home and was very careful to hide when necessary and to only approach those people she felt she could trust. At one point, the three girls hid up a tree to avoid being seen by a small plane flying low to search for them. The girls had barely enough to eat and grew thin and weak. A few weeks away from Jigalong, Gracie was told by a stockman that her mother had moved to another station. So Gracie left Molly and Daisy to catch a train to try to find her mother. Gracie wasn't successful as the authorities found her and returned her to Moor River. After nine weeks of walking 1,600 kilometres, Molly and Daisy finally arrived in Jigalong and were reunited with their families. Their journey was the equivalent of walking from one end of New Zealand to the other. The day after Molly and Daisy were reunited with their families here in Jigalong, everyone moved camp deep into the bush. Official records contained correspondence that the girls were occasionally sighted, but basically they went into hiding with their families for many years. Four years after Molly, Gracie and Daisy escaped, the Mosley Royal Commission visited Moor River Settlement and were horrified by the dirty, cramped conditions here. The Royal Commission recommended that the Moor River Settlement be closed and that Mr Neville, the protector of Aborigines in Western Australia, be sacked. But Mr Neville continued to blame his problems on the lack of money provided by the government and he remained in his position until he retired. The Moor River Settlement remained open. Nine years after their escape, Molly was taken to Moor River again after surgery for appendicitis. Now a married woman with two young daughters, Molly spent 12 months at Moor River before deciding to leave. She made the walk back to Jigalong a second time carrying her 18-month-old baby all the way. Molly's older daughter, Doris, had to remain. Doris was educated here at Moor River and became a nurse. She didn't see her mother until she was an adult. Molly's youngest daughter was taken from her when the girl was four years old. She was told she was an orphan and was adopted. Molly never saw her baby girl again. And what about Daisy? Well, she hid in the desert with her family until she was an adult. Following the trauma of her early years, Daisy found peace in the promises of the Bible, accepted Jesus and became a Christian. Then she worked as a housemaid in various stations in the district. She married and had four children. After her husband died, she wanted her children to have a Christian education and so moved here to Karalundi Mission and School. Her children attended the school here, finally able to freely attend an independent school for Aboriginal children. Daisy worked as a cook and housekeeper and was active in the church community. When she retired, Daisy returned to Jigalong and moved into a house next to Molly. Today, Jigalong is an Aboriginal community the land was returned to the Madu people in 1974. It has a community school, shops, and a medical clinic. The construction of the rabbit-proof fence is typical of a European concept of ownership, 
laying out a boundary, marking one's territory, pegging out a corner or staking a claim. This is so very different from an Aboriginal concept of ownership. The fences that are influential in Aboriginal communities are social and cultural, seen in the light of relationships, social obligations and sacred places. The story of Molly, Gracie and Daisy's epic walk illustrates the importance of hope, the power of relationships and the meaning of home. Molly's home and family were so vitally important to her that she held on to her dream of going home with hope and determination, refusing to be intimidated by those who wanted to control her future. Sadly, throughout history, unscrupulous leaders have subjugated and uprooted innocent people and defenseless nations in an attempt to control them. But it doesn't necessarily mean the end. There is still hope. For example, in the Bible, Jeremiah chapter 29 is a letter to a community in exile. They'd been uprooted and taken from their homes. They were in a strange land, a foreign land. The letter carries an encouraging message about holding on to hope and refusing to be intimidated by those abusing their power. In the letter, God speaks through the prophet Jeremiah to exiles living in Babylon almost 600 years before Jesus' birth. The recipients of the letter had just lived through a horror similar to that experienced by many indigenous families during the time when their children were forcibly removed and placed in state institutions. Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian army had just invaded Judah, capturing thousands of people, taking them from their homes and deporting them to Babylon. This letter was written to people in incredible pain, more than most of us will ever experience. They were mourning death, their children had been stolen, they were experiencing a forced move and a transition to a strange land and a foreign culture. And yet into that tragic situation, God can still speak words of hope. Listen, here's God's promise to people who feel they're in a hopeless situation. Here's what He says to the dispossessed and downtrodden in Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 10 and 11. I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God has a special message for those who have been dispossessed. He has a special message for those who have been uprooted from their homes and taken to a strange land, a foreign land. And the message is, no matter what has happened in the past, no matter how dark the situation may seem to you, God is in control. You have not been forgotten. God cares about every intricate detail in your life. God has a plan for your life. He will bring you peace and give you a future that is filled with hope. But that's not all. Listen as we read further in Jeremiah chapter 29. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. What a wonderful promise from God. He promises to bring us back from captivity. You may be held captive by fear, loss, substance abuse, guilt, or a broken relationship. God is saying, trust me, I have everything under control. The situation may not be good, but I know what I'm doing. I have your best interest in mind. I will bring you back. God promises hope to any community that has lost almost everything. He promises hope to every individual who has experienced loss. And it was this hope that Molly and Daisy found. It was this hope that took them home and gave them peace in later life. 
they discovered that they had not been forgotten and that God did have a plan for their lives. They accepted Jesus as their Saviour and found true peace and hope for the future. Hope for this life and beyond. If you've been held captive by fear, loss, substance abuse or a broken relationship and would like to experience this peace and hope, why not ask for it right now as we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, the story of Molly, Gracie and Daisy is both heartbreaking and inspiring. We thank you for being a God of love who cares for each one of us. It's reassuring to know that you have a good plan for our lives. We are grateful that whatever difficulty and challenge we may be facing, you are working good in all of it. And so today, we step forward in faith and hope, trusting you in all things and seeking to cooperate fully with your plans for us. Thank you for giving us peace for today and hope for tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray, Amen. If you are facing challenges in your life and would like to find peace today and hope for the future, I'd like to tell you about the free gift we have for all our viewers today. It's an inspiring booklet called Seeing Through God's Eyes. This book shares the secret of finding true happiness in our lives. It shows us way to deal with the challenges we face in everyday life and how to find peace and hope. This book is our gift to you and is absolutely free. There is no cost or obligation. So please don't miss this wonderful opportunity to receive the gift we have for you today. Here's the information you need. Phone us now on 048 101 or text us on 0491 222999 or visit our website theincrediblejourney.tv to request today's free offer. So don't delay. Contact us right now. If you've enjoyed today's journey, be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together and experience another new and thought-provoking perspective on the peace, insight, understanding and hope that only the Bible can give us. The incredible journey truly is television that changes lives. Until next week, remember the ultimate destination of life's journey. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away.